Thanks so much. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Notre Dame, uh, the American Principles Project, uh, Heartland Institute, uh, and others for all of their hard work. It's really, uh, in a way, appropriate that we wrap up the day uh, on the issue of school choice and how it interacts with Common Core, because in a way, that's really where it began here in Indiana. Uh, and so I really want to acknowledge uh, um, both Heather and Aaron, Catholic school moms, who first really confronted Common Core uh, as it uh, interacted with their Catholic schools really through the Indiana uh, voucher program. Um, so I'm going to kind of broadly define school choice as we like to at Pioneer Institute in Boston um, as uh, parents selecting regular public schools, you know, according to zip code, charter public schools, voc vocational technical schools, private schools, parochial, virtual, uh, deseg state deseg desegregation programs, homeschoolers, et cetera. And I, and I think that's appropriate to to frame it really in that way because, you know, what is school choice but the best expression really of, of, uh, of liberty and the natural rights of parents to direct the intellectual, spiritual, and moral development of their kids. Um, and I think the founders intuitively understood these things. They uh, delegated certain responsibilities, and we heard a lot about that uh, earlier, uh, to the national government. So defense and foreign policy and trade and the like, but they were very careful uh, about retaining those dimensions of what we think of as classical republicanism drawn from uh, Greek city-states uh, and um, other modern uh, republics as a way to help perpetuate uh, a localism and civic uh, participation. And so while the U.S. Constitution is virtually silent on the topic of education, the state constitutions are very specific, and I'll just mention a couple. Uh, so the oldest written constitution in the world is the Massachusetts State Constitution, which was drafted by John Adams in 1779-1780, and there's a whole paragraph or so called the Cherish Clause, and it talks very specifically about uh, the, the uh, interest of le future legislators and public officials to cherish the interests of literature and mathematics and science uh, and the like. Uh, and it's also equally true in Virginia, where Thomas Jefferson and George Mason and others had a hand in crafting that state's constitution. There's a lot of very specific uh, references to the responsibilities of, uh, of, of, of state and local governments to really perpetuate these things. Even in Massachusetts, they were, they, uh, John Adams went a step further, and it gives, gives you a sense of how he and others in Massachusetts in the founding era regar regarded the separation of church and state, where he said it's actually the local responsibility uh, to pay for ministers to educate uh, uh, education. Um, so, uh, you know, I have my own Alexis de Tocqueville uh, quote, too, uh, that, but, uh, that I'll sort of set aside, but uh, basically, a, a, a century later, uh, a British political scientist uh, and lord, uh, James Bryce, wrote a two-volume book called The American Commonwealth. And even after the substantive changes that the country uh, undertook in the 19th century after the Civil War, he observed many of the same kinds of things about state and local governments, as well as the energy of our democracy being found in local civic religious uh, organizations. Um, but there's no question. I think everyone can agree, and it's the 30th anniversary of a nation risk, that, and uh, we can agree that something went wrong, I think, in public education. I think people on all sides of the spectrum can acknowledge that. And by 1983, President Reagan's nation at risk uh, report prescribed uh, all the sort of, uh, in punishing detail, how badly we had really fallen in comparison to international competition. What they did not do was prescribe uh, top-down solutions from Washington, D.C., being fully respectful of the, the state and local responsibility to uh, remediate these problems. Um, and what they, uh, but um, you know, what they did do, and, and what happened gradually throughout the 1980s, and including a lot of uh, energetic efforts at the state level is, is, the, is that Milton Friedman and a, a handful of other uh, economists and uh, free marketeers really began to push this idea of school choice. And that kind of manifests itself in a variety of different voucher and, ch and charter schools. Uh, and so to get a sense of what people have in mind about what a, a free market of education might look like, I'll, I'll sort of draw on the, 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 the tale of the other city in, in this country, which is higher education. The fact is, is that we have an excellent model of education that's right before our eyes, 
um, and it often is just in plain sight and we don't recognize it. Um, higher education in this country is really the envy of the world. I think even at this late date with some of the damage that political correctness has done to the humanities, uh, certainly it is the envy of the world. It's radically decentralized, oftentimes by department. I don't think any of the academics that we've had here would ever um, tolerate, frankly, uh, maybe even their university dictating what the standards of their curriculum or the course of study would be or the testing uh, connected to it. And they certainly wouldn't tolerate from, from a bunch of uh, unelected trade groups from Washington, D.C. But it's also, it, it's, uh, higher education in this country is really driven by school choice. There's a wide variety of public, private, religious, vocational options across the spectrum. And so when people like Pioneer Institute um, who are big advocates of school choice and have been for 20 years. It was really the you know, kind of raison d'etre of our, our, of our founding. Uh, th that's what we have in mind. We have a ro robust uh, and energetic variety of options so that parents can really take advantage of, uh, of the best um, education that's suited for their, their kids. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Massachusetts, because Massachusetts has been discussed a little bit here, but not in a lot of detail. And I'm just going to go through quickly. So in 1993, um, with no encouragement or direction or support or anything from the federal government, state legislators, uh, Tom Birmingham, a very liberal Democrat from a very poor city just north of uh, Boston, Chelsea, um, Rhodes Scholar, Harvard Law School, a uh, very well-educated guy, uh, got together with Mark Roosevelt, the great-great-grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, and Bill Weld, who was a Republican governor, and they, they crafted really what is a, a, the grand bargain, it's called, of Massachusetts. And what the grand bargain was is that they put a great deal of additional resources into K-12 education, uh, about $100 billion in the last 20 years in exchange for all of the hard things that no one in public education really wanted to do. Specifically, they ignored the direction that had been sort of plaguing public education uh, over the previous decades, which is this sort of workforce development skills-based approach that you uh, have seen time and time again. And I think in point of fact is one of the reasons why public education has been in stagnation and decline. They specifically ignored that. And these guys had gr deep grounding in, in uh, private and parochial schooling and liberal arts, and so they enlisted people like Sandra Stotsky and others to craft standards that went in a completely different direction. And so Sandy and others have spoken a lot of detail about what's in that, but you know, in, in a synthesis, it's basically 90% 90, 90 of what kids were studying was you know, classic literature, drama, and poetry. Um, in mathematics, they uh, emulated uh, high-performing uh, Asian countries and made sure the kids were prepared for uh, Algebra 1 by 8th grade because that's the gateway for all higher level mathematics. Uh, and then they connected these, uh, and, and really it was again Sandy's work, uh, aligned then the standards with a high-stakes graduation test, not a cumbersome variety of tests, but uh, some uh, points of, of uh, diagnostic uh, work at different and appropriate grades and then having uh, a, uh, a, a graduation requirement based on the state test that was also then aligned with the, with the teacher test, which had the academic content found in the standards. So it's this sort of golden triangle that sits at the center of the success of Massachusetts, uh, as, well as, as well as charter schools. Um, and just to kind of give you, before I talk a little bit more about the, both the success of Massachusetts, but the, the sort of variety of choice options that kind of sprung out of this, I think it's, you know, to give you a sense of how serious Massachusetts was about classic literature is, is that after they had passed these literature-rich standards, the chair of the Board of Education was John Silber, the uh, president, his late president of uh, of uh, Boston University, the fourth largest private university in the country, he wanted to go a step further and actually mandate that every kid had to read Moby Dick by the time they graduated from high school. Now that did not pass, but it gives you a clear sense from the top, from the Board of Education, from the various legislative uh, and gubernatorial players in Massachusetts, how seriously they took classic literature. In fact, and I'll just use it sort of an anecdotal example, um, my dad went to uh, Deerfield Academy, which is the same uh, prep school in New England that Bill Evers went to. Uh, and my, and uh, upon observing the kinds of things that my uh, nephews were reading in, uh, Mass in Massachusetts schools, in, in middle school and in, in high school, he declared that the Massachusetts standards were of higher quality than what he had at Deerfield Academy in the 1950s. Uh, and then in the area of mathematics, he said it was even significantly higher than some of the things that he had his freshman year at Bowdoin College. And this is a guy who ultimately went on to get a master's degree in civil engineering from MIT. So while it's anecdotal, it does give you a clear sense that um, the standards were good and they were traditional as in traditional 50 plus years in the past. 
Uh, and so what this led to was an enormous historic gains. I mean, the uh, people have talked a little bit about it. No state had ever been number one in the country uh, in every grade tested on the NAEP test, the NAEP National Assessment of Educational Progress. In 2005, Massachusetts ran the, the, uh, the, the table and, and was number one. Every grade tested, every subject. They did it again in 2007, 2009, 2011, and then tested as its own individual country in 2007 and 2011, and, and its eighth graders in 2007 tested right, were tied for number one in the world um, in, in science. Uh, so it was really a remarkable turn of events because as people can tell from a lot of these debates, Developing these standards is very, very difficult. It's a tough fight. I mean, they often describe uh, 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 standards debates as like, you know, moving a graveyard or something. But the fact is, that, and I'm not saying this about my state to, to, to brag, I'm saying it because it can be done. We don't need to look to Singapore or Hong Kong or Finland or whatever the country de jour is. We have a model right here in this country, and it does require leadership at the state level and the legislative level, and it requires the Board of Education and others to really take it seriously and follow through. One of the real benefits we had in Massachusetts was that we had a variety of Republican governors and then real continuity with our Democratic leadership that helped keep all this in place. And so, you know, it's with a certain degree of pride we do say that, you know, the race to the top was really the race to become Massachusetts. So some of the, some of the features of that, again, I'll sort of break down and, and how this impacted school choice, how the, the previous standards in, impacted school choice. So, um, the charter school record, and I'm a big advocate of charter schools across the country, uh, is actually a mixed one. Uh, the, there's, uh, it's, they're only slightly higher performing than many of the traditional schools. That's not the case in Massachusetts, and we've got a lot of quantitative evidence to, to demonstrate that. So there, we have about 75 charters in Massachusetts. I think at this point, approximately 10 to 12 percent of kids in Massachusetts are in some kind of school choice, whether it's private, parochial, charter, whatever, and that's been relatively constant over time. Um, but these charter schools, really what they did is that they used all of the tools embedded in the education reform law that I talked about from 1993 better than the other schools did, and that says a lot because the state in the aggregate is, uh, you know, best in the country. So. What did, they, what did they do? They, they first and foremost had the, the, the driving mission of these schools uh, to be academic. It's not workforce development, it's not skills, it's not all this other stuff that's sort of the fad that blows in. They really committed to, uh, to academics. Um, they embrace school-based management so that the principals and the teachers, the people at the, at the school level are making the decisions. And, and in, in point of fact, they went right, they, you know, went beyond the Massachusetts standards too, but they, they certainly use that as the major basis of it. Uh, and then they embrace the accountability measures. And so there's, uh, there's a couple of sets of research that have come out in the last several years about Massachusetts charters. There's two that was published by researchers at Harvard, MIT, and Duke uh, that talk about essentially within two or three years, kids that are in the lowest performing district like Boston, within uh, a couple years of being in uh, these high performing, no excuses charters uh, are able to uh, outperform the kids in the, one of the leafy suburbs right outside of Boston, which is really a remarkable uh, turn of events. And then the Credo Institute, or, sorry, the uh, Credo Research, is, it's an institute out at Stanford University, just came out with research in the last year, and they basically said that for all intents and purposes, um, be, uh, one year um, in, in a charter school is like two years in a traditional public school in Massachusetts. And that's, again, that's saying quite a lot because the performance in the traditional, traditional public schools are really stellar. But in a certain regard, particularly for this whole topic of workforce development, there's another school choice model that's been in place for a long time in Massachusetts, which is the, re, the vocational technical schools. For many, many decades, and these schools have been around since the 50s or so, we have the oldest vocational technical program in the country, and it's, uh, there are schools of choice, parents uh, uh, and students select them. Um, for a long time, they, fr frankly, they were dumping grounds for uh, kids with uh, uh, special needs and kids that were not on an academic tra uh, track. They were not uh, desirable schools, and I think even the voc tech schools, and we've done a lot of research long before Common Core uh, came along uh, chronicling this, um, they, they have, in fact, you know, twice the special need population. So Massachusetts, in its generosity, has a significantly higher of special needs kids that they've designated than the rest of the country. And these voc tech schools have basically twice that, that figure. 
And what they've seen after embracing the standards, and again, we did a paper on it really chronicling and mentioning line and verse about how, you know, uh, the, the reality is to compete in the 21st century, whether you're going to be a carpenter or electrician or a uh, auto mechanic, is, is that the world of mathematics and science and, and computers is one that is um, weighing even more heavily on the vocational uh, uh, enterprises. And what we saw under these standards, again, these standards that Sandy developed uh, and led to these historic successes is that, that the, the Massachusetts Vocational Technical Schools improved by about, basically about 45% in the last seven or eight years. And so even if the advocates of Common Core are talking about a workforce development model, which I think is flawed, uh, when parents and students pick that path for their kids, the evidence is actually quite clear, is that if kids have this deep grounding in the classic liberal arts, and high quality literature and poetry and drama, as well as high quality mathematics at, uh, uh, in, in high school, that they can have remarkable gains. And again, these MCAS scores, which are, are, are state tests, have correlated with these gains on NAEP. Um, so in the area of um, um, Catholic schooling, and because that's the largest uh, school choice option that parents take advantage of in, in Massachusetts, Massachusetts really likes to do things both early and with, you know, real radicalism. We, we don't allow for vouchers in Massachusetts because we have a, uh, most states have what they call a Blaine Amendment or an anti-aid amendment that prohibits, pu prohibits public dollars flowing to private or parochial schools. But Massachusetts, are, whereas ours are so old, they're called the Know Nothing Amendments. They're established by the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s. Uh, and if that wasn't bad enough, then there was another sort of nativist impulse that uh, passed another constitutional amendment in the uh, early part of the 20th century that prevented that first Know Nothing Amendment from being repealed via uh, initiative petition or ballot process. So we have these barriers. But that said, uh, about 10 years ago, the Archdiocese of Massachusetts began to observe the successes that the Massachusetts public schools were having, and I think in their wisdom realized that the Massachusetts, previous Massachusetts standards, with its deep grounding in the humanities and classical literature and poetry, was very much aligned with the, the Catholic education. And so they, too, adapted the Massachusetts standards. Now, some people say, oh, that's, that's not great because now they've adopted Common Core and, and, and that, that practice is not a good one. They are a little bit different in the sense that they don't take in the state test. So they're not boxed in in the same way that people here are in Indiana. But what is clear about the experience with the Catholic schools, the Archdiocese schools, which is actually the largest school district in the state. It's about 70,000 students, so it's about um, 15,000 students larger than Boston, this, uh, Boston Public Schools, is that they too have had these remarkable gains. So there's kind of a pattern going on here where if you adopt these high quality standards grounded in the liberal arts, that it's going to lead to remarkable gains, as well as Massachusetts Public Schools have done, and there's not a lot of great apples to apples comparison. There's the SAT and the Standard 10. The archdiocese schools in Massachusetts outperform the Massachusetts public schools. So there's another piece of evidence. So you can see that we've had, in Massachusetts, we have a, um, you know, a lot at stake with Common Core, which is really why back in 2009, 2010, Pioneer Institute um, be first began the four crosswalks that Zev and Dr. Milgram and, and Dr. Stotsky uh, did for us on the academic quality. It's why we then commissioned Kent Talbert and Bob Itell, the number one and number two lawyer in the US Department of Education under the second Bush administration to look at the legal issues. And it's been discussed a little bit here, but there's basically three federal laws that explicitly prohibits the federal government from funding, directing, and validating uh, national standards testing and curricula, and also cost. Because the fact is, is that no one has done any independent analysis, and very few states, in fact, have done an independent analysis of what this will cost the states and localities, which will pay for 90% of it. And even at this late date, the federal government only pays for a small fraction of K-12 education. So this is something that they'll, they'll uh, folks at the local level have the pleasure of paying for. But I think for the purposes of a discussion uh, about school choice, it's also important to realize that the major drivers behind Common Core, the Governor's Association, the Council of Chief State School Officers, the U.S. Department of Education, the, a the American Federation for Teachers, the uh, National Education Association, the PTA, the Gates Foundation, and Achieving, on top of having, over the last 25 years, a very poor record on academic standards and improving student achievement, frankly, anywhere, they're also, none of those folks are advocates of, 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 uh, of school choice. They, in fact, many of them have an out, outright hostility to school choice. So 
the problem with states uh, adopting a, a voucher program that has the state test connected to it and pulls the kids then into the Common Core through the standards and the test is that they're actually playing right into the hands of the people who for decades have despised school choice. So what is this going to mean for school choice? Well, I think it, in a way it answers itself. If all of the standards in the states, the SAT, the ACT, all these uh, measures are aligned to it, School choice isn't going to mean anything under Common Core because you're just going to have, you know, voc tech schools teaching Common Core. You're going to have parochial schools teaching Common Core, or charter schools, private schools, et cetera. I mean, it's really no choice at all. It's, it's a devastating blow to the school choice effort. And frankly, it's why people like Tony Bennett, whether he's in Indiana or Florida, just doesn't get it. And if he does get it, then he's playing right into the hands of the people that, that have, have hostility to, towards it. So... I guess in sort of conclusion, there's a couple things that I would just say. Um, work very hard to kind of decouple your state voucher programs from, uh, from the state test. It's a bad practice uh, that will, um, and, and, and Aaron and Heather are certainly a, a experts on that. But I think the other one too is to really keep in mind that over 100 archdioceses across the country have adopted Common Core too, which is just inexplicable because they have traditionally been higher performing than the public schools. And I think we know that they, while they've been uh, very successful, that they have enrollment problems. And, they, and there's a lot, I mean, we know in Massachusetts, the Archdiocese of Boston uh, adopted and then took Gates money. So um, thank you for your attention. I appreciate everyone's hard work and effort on this. Uh, we're working in about 20 some odd states at this point. And uh, these kinds of events, and I think if you look at the audience, a significant number of the people are moms and grandmothers. This is really a, a mom-driven movement. And I would encourage you to continue to educate yourself about it. And I appreciate your, your attention. Thanks.